Hi, this is Education Matters on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm your host, Carol Monley, with my special guest, mixed media sculpture and artist, Chris Ritson, who combines nature and science to create the most exciting artwork. Some of Chris's work is currently on exhibit at the Honolulu Biennial 2017, the Contemporary Visual Arts Festival running now through May 8th at the site of the old Sports Authority on Ward and at other venues. Chris describes his work as creating a dialogue with the environment to imagine new ways of interacting with nature. His work is not just visually interesting and stimulating, but adds a whole other dimension to art by engaging the mind and the heart in examining a multitude of relationships. So welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. So Chris, how long have you been an artist? Oh, uh, um, I guess officially maybe like nine or ten years, but pretty much been something I've been involved in my whole life. Mm -hmm. But I know you studied in college, you studied both um, science. Yeah. Uh, let's see, well... And philosophy. Yeah, initially I went to Reed College in Portland. Uh, I was really geared towards philosophy and uh, theoretical sort of things, but uh, for one reason or another I came back to Hawaii. Uh, I went to UH and was very, uh, switched my interests a lot, got into uh, aquaculture, came back to work on a shrimp farm and I went to UH and uh, studied, started studying to do that. Uh, so more biotechnology, right? Yeah, yeah, real basic, but uh, definitely interested in agriculture and the way it relates to environmental issues at that point. Um, and then? Yeah, pretty quickly uh, I thought my, the role I should be filling or the role that's best for me was working with uh, ideas and paradigms and uh, not just creating products, but creating ideas around those environmental issues I was uh, engaged with. And how did art then, as a way of expressing these ideas, how did that become the, the medium? Hmm, I guess art allows you to uh, look at a subject and investigate it in ways that uh, other academic processes didn't really allow for. So uh, the work I do, I try to engage it with an actual uh, process in nature, in the environment, in the world that uh, has an impact in a way that uh, you know an essay couldn't. Right. So it's interesting because your background, your education background, really um, is the perfect background to help you put together all these different forms of um, uh, uh, art, as we've talked, as the title of our show indicates, art, science, um, and nature into your art form. So let's uh, show some images because these are really interesting. It'll give our public. So what is this first <laughs> image? Uh, this is a detailed shot of an installation I have at the Honolulu Biennial this year. Right, and it looks like there's a pair of glasses yeah. and a bottle. So and this detail is inside of an aquarium. Uh, you're looking at a bunch of garbage I collected off of the reefs outside of urban Honolulu, Waikiki, uh, Honolulu Harbor area. And this garbage is selected because it's covered in this really interesting algae, uh, coralline algae, a uh, whole multitude of species in this colony. But it is this sort of crusty purple stuff you see growing on the garbage. Uh, so this is the natural state once it's been dumped into the ocean. I mean, it's a quite... Yeah. Some of these bottles are from the 70s. There's an old Coke bottle there. Uh, there's a Heineken bottle in the back that's probably only a few years old. Mm -hmm. But this stuff is really voracious in the reef, and it plays a really important role. Um, as it encrusts these things, uh, it ultimately will cement them together. So as the reef crumbles apart, as corals die, it's glued back together by this stuff. And it's kind of referred to as the cement of the reef. So is it, con now let's show the next slide. Okay, now this is actually the installation, the larger, those pieces are in these. Yeah, this is on display for uh, about another week here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gar this is an aquarium system designed to cultivate that algae. I see, so we're looking at, for our podcast listeners, we're looking at a picture uh, inside a large room with two aquariums, and they're connected? Yes, they're all connected. Uh, each aquarium has slightly different uh, wave parameters in it to simulate different sort of environments. And the two are connected by a third aquarium underneath it, which houses a series of filtration units uh -huh. and a CO2 unit. And this is designed to alter the water in a way that uh, is what, uh, 
alter the water in a way that it could be affected in the future, uh, having to do with environmental climate change, uh, specifically CO2. Right. Uh, carbon dioxide in the air is dissolved into the water here, and we create a more acidic, there's a heater to make it slightly warmer. So, so have you seen the, um, I'm not sure, do you call it debris, the, the mm -hmm. last slide that we saw with the glasses and yes. the Coke bottle? Has it evolved, changed much over the course of the um, festival? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing that happens is a lot of it dies off in the system. Uh, this, this algae is really susceptible to uh, specifically the sort of changes uh, higher carbon dioxide levels will have in the water. So certain ones died off very quickly. And then after a couple months, other ones started to come back. Mm. And so I'm really interested in the ones that are surviving here. And as they reproduce, they start to grow on those panels that are submersed in the tank. Right. So uh, it's been a very slow process. Uh, I was originally looking at a couple of years to realize this project, but I think there's been a lot that's happened in the past couple of months that are pretty interesting. So that if anybody went to, and like I attended the opening of mm -hmm. the show, which was about two months ago, right, mm -hmm. uh, and went back this week, the actual exhibit would look different because of the growth and the dying off of, of different yeah. algae. Yeah, well, you should bring your glasses. I have my it's, glasses. It's <laughs> very small changes right I now. See. Um, it's very small change, and uh, that's sort of the reality of working with these organisms, is that they are very slow, but uh, what is more important to me is a sort of performance of doing this act that is creating an art object, an uh, archival object in the end. That was my original interest, is because once these panels are removed, the, the algae will be archival. It will last forever, uh, so long as it's properly cared for. It, it won't uh, decay in any way. It will turn into a white uh, calcium. It looks like lichen, ultimately. So what is the plan for it? So after the close of the uh, art uh, festival on May 8th, you mm -hmm. will take them out of the aquarium. Yes. And what will you do with them? Display them? Uh, yeah, they'll probably be preserved and displayed, um, depending on what sort of system I set up back in my studio. I may save, uh, clone some of the, organ the individuals that did really well, save for another, uh, maybe another installation I'm doing with them. But uh, I think this one's run its course here. <laughs> I think they will be preserved in, as documents of the performance and the installation. I see. So this is really interesting to me because how do you classify it? It's not a painting, it's not a sculpture, it's an art object, you said. I yeah, said well, it's, it's an installation creating an object. Uh, the, the work itself is this performance I'm doing in the space, which is setting up the aquarium and uh, allowing this chemical interplay to happen and the, the algaes to grow in relation to it. Um, it is producing an art object. It is producing within it a discrete object, which can be viewed like a painting. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, Ultimately, it is a time-based installation mm. and uh, performance with my interaction with it. So as I was telling our audience, this is really unique because uh, I had never been really exposed to this kind of uh, art. Let's, let's show the second uh, set of images. Okay, and now we're looking at what sort of looks like a traditional panel, a uh, gold uh, oblong panel. What, what is that, Chris? This is a... Uh, well, it, this is made out of sawdust and the mycelia of a mushroom. Uh, a mushroom? A okay. mushroom, yeah. So this is a mushroom painting. Uh, so it's on a gold background, or is that the wood? That's, that's the walls it's against. Uh, the Honolulu Biennial, all the rooms are done with just raw wood. Uh -huh. um, but the square? It, it, yeah, so I take, I, I acquire the sawdust uh, from reforestation efforts up in our spot in Tantalus. So we cut down these invasive trees, I grind them up, and I sterilize the sawdust, and I inoculate it with uh, the mushroom mycelia. Uh, the mycelia is the root structure of the mushroom. It's something you usually never see. Uh, if you think of mushrooms as an apple tree, perhaps, the entire tree is underground. The apple is the mushroom you see. So the mycelia travels through the sawdust and binds it all together. Huh. So is this something, mycelia, you get from the outside? Yeah. Uh, I well, I collect them locally. Okay. Uh, I find fungus in the forest. There's a really broad variety of fungus introduced from all over the world. Uh, I take it home and I clone it 
in agar. Uh, so in your studio, yeah, you're cloning a, yes. slide matter. <laughs> yeah, I have a. Um, so it's almost like a biology lab. It is. It's a. It's a very. DIY sort of biology lab. Uh, I do most of my work in Tupperware. I sterilize my petri dishes with canning jars. I use all very accessible objects, and most of that's been made available through the internet and through, uh, you know, people who are taking science out of the laboratory and into their homes and working with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting growing process that we've only been using since like maybe the early 80s. For the longest time, mushrooms were really hard to cultivate, and people did them on logs. But this method was found and developed. And commercially, anyone who's grown mushrooms, they have this block at the end after they've fruited. And uh, it's very obviously a really valuable object and resource we can use for building uh, and design. But I'm really interested as it applies to producing a sort of environmentally sustainable art object. Right. Well, let's show the next slide because now we can see how that particular panel is part of a much bigger installation. So we're looking here now at a slide of a entire room which is dedicated to Chris's work, this particular work at the Biennial. And you want to describe it to our Yeah. Viewers? So there is a series of uh, mushroom paintings in here. How many are there on the walls? I believe there's, let's see, four, eight... 13 of them all together. On all four walls. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they're all the same sort of wood and the same sort of mushroom, but they all have pretty drastically different patterns on them. And uh, this is what's so interesting to me is that as the mushroom grows, it interacts with tiny other bacteria and yeasts and other fungus in the air and creates these really brilliant patterns and ultimately creates its own composition. So I'm not involved in the way these come out, in the patterns, and the painting of them in any way. You don't know, it's up to nature. I have no clue, yeah. Right. Um, all I can do is initiate it and let it do its thing. So when did this particular project start? How, often, how long have you been working on? Mm, this one mushroom? took about three months. Three months, yeah. and then, and what will happen to this installation after the show? Uh, it'll probably go into storage, but all of these works are, ar themselves, they are archival. Um, often, I when will... When you say archival, what... what it means mean? that we can preserve them. Uh, they won't uh, rot away in any way. Uh, generally, we use the term for art supplies, uh, like a piece of paper. Certain papers won't last, aren't designed to last, right. but <clears throat> these objects are in their entire design made to last. So, you know, most artists um, produce art and with the hope that eventually it is purchased and acquired and placed mm -hmm. in some collection and viewed by people who can appreciate it beyond the artist. So, are you, is that a goal of yours? Do you look at selling your pieces like this? Yes, well, I think that's always the challenge, how the artist integrates with the market and the way you integrate with the market speaks a lot to how you are working with value and with capitalism. Um, these <clears throat> are attempts to create uh, biological objects that can be sold, that are preservable, but that's not necessarily my ambition, and that's been a nice thing to pursue with installation art. Uh, experiences like the Honolulu Biennial, where the work isn't even for sale, uh, lets you, let's or talk about other issues that aren't necessarily involved in the uh, market. I think I have uh, struggled, really, finding biological generative uh, things that are archival and you can uh, produce as an object to sell. And that has been the biggest challenge. But in doing that, I think uh, it contributes a lot to the concept. Right. OK, well, on that interesting note, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back to show some more of Chris Ritson's uh, artwork, and uh, we'll be right back. Thanks.
Well, welcome back. This is Caroline Lee on Education Matters with my guest, uh, media artist Chris Ritson, who has brought some really interesting pieces to our attention. Uh, a type of installation art that actually I've never seen before that is being exhibited right now at the Biennial. He is one of a handful of Pacific artists who have been identified and are being um, exhibited. And so congratulations on that, Chris. But actually your work is uh, all over the, the country and the world. I know you've exhibited um, many places. Yeah, I've had the chance to send some of my stuff around. Um, the internet's really helped with that. I used to work with video a lot, and uh, you were in San Francisco for a while too. Yeah, I, I went to in New York. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, both. Uh, I, I went to art school in San Francisco ultimately, <coughs> and stayed there for a little bit. And uh, I think I was really involved in video art then, animation work, and uh, so it's really evolved. So you did the uh, media, I uh, mean, video. Yes. And I real worked sculpture. With video and more more traditional sculpture before moving back here. Um, then coming back to Hawaii, uh, you know, I grew up here my whole life, but uh, coming back, there are different issues that are much more relevant and uh, pertinent to be covering here. I think for me, it was about the environment. About the environment, nature, nature yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you, I know you live in Tanlis, where you have a bountiful. Uh, Backyard, a forest. Yeah, I'm very fortunate to spend my raw time materials. there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at a couple of more images of Chris's work. Now, what are we looking at here, Chris? This is a very interesting. So this is a series I was doing uh, a few years ago. Uh, they're made from an element called bismuth. Uh, it's probably familiar with it. It's a key ingredient, in Pepto Bismol. Ah, uh, but it looks like crystal. Yeah. So it's. I acquire it in its raw form. It's like a silver metal. It kind of looks like lead. And uh, in a pretty controlled environment, I melt it down. It melts at a fairly low temperature. And uh, I cool it. As I cool it, it recrystallizes. And this is its atomic structure, uh, this sort of lattice cube within a cube. Uh, and multicolored. Yeah. The, Yellow, green, purple. Yeah. As I pull it out of the molten metal, that forms instantly. It's actually a, a rust on the uh, crystal. It's mm -hmm. a really thin layer of rust and it happens to be this dichromatic, beautiful, colorful thing. So, And then you place it on top of a, as you said, we were talking, it's a tchotchke, right? Yeah, well, I, okay, so these porcelain figures are acquired or found uh, mostly at, you know, secondhand stores, things like that. They're very uh, traditional objects you would have on your mantelpiece or something like that. Uh, the crystal's actually grown off of them, so they're submerged into the molten metal and act as a catalyst, which the crystal starts, because of the temperature change of sticking that in, it starts to grow off the form. Yeah, we have another uh, image of that one, Rob? Yes, and here, and this is one of a sculpture. The last one was an elephant, it looked like, and this is a... Yeah, woman? well, the, the last one was actually, it was a, uh, a, a figure, it was one of the magi from the... Uh, Let's see, the nativity scene. Right. Had a whole series from the nativity scene. Um, this, I believe, is more of a sort of Greco-Roman sculpture. Of a woman. It's of all woman, in white. Yeah. But the uh, crystal growth is uh, on top of the head and the arms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular series, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen uh, at the Honolulu Museum of Art. So that was, what, 2014? Uh, that was 2012. 2012. Yeah, during the Artists of Hawaii, it was a sort of overview of uh, a handful of local artists. They do it every other year. Um, and you were selected as one of those artists. Yeah, it was a really interesting show. Uh, I showed two different types of work. I showed those and some other paperwork, and uh, you know that stuff had been really popular. That got a lot of uh, play on the internet. And the last two pictures were uh, commissioned by. Uh, a photography company, VSCO, out of Oakland. Um, I think a lot of these objects have been very successful in sale, but for me, they're really about the photographs of them. Uh, I see. And what do you do with the photographs? Do you have a website? Oh, yeah. Well, I did, they're on my website, certainly. Um, ChrisRitson.com. ChrisRitson.com. Yeah. Very Please good. check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that particular last series with the, and what's the name? Bis Bismuth. Bismuth on top of yeah. the piece of <laughs> tchotchke, um, was actually award-winning piece, right? Yeah, those, uh, those were, got some awards at the museum show. Um, 
and yeah, it was a successful show, I think. Uh, it was acquired by? Uh, the, the Twig Smith Foundation bought them. Right. Uh, I think they donated them back to the museum. Yeah, so it's in the permanent collection. Somewhere. That's a big honor. <laughs> Somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah, so that shows you that uh, they're recognizing this interesting. Yeah, well, it's um, good to see a lot of more interest in contemporary art in Hawaii. Uh, I think since I moved back, it's been a really exciting time. And uh, I came back, I felt like just a, you know, five years ago or so, and there's very few opportunities. Uh, aware of very few artists here, but uh, very quickly, I've seen a lot of people become very interested in it, and all these people come out of the woodworks, and uh, it's just such an interesting place to be working. I'm so happy. Are there a lot of artists doing what you're doing in this kind of uh, installation art? Um, I mean, maybe not so many in Hawaii. I think in Hawaii, we most of us are exposed to the sort of uh, Lahaina galleries with, uh, you know, dolphins and waterfalls. And uh, obviously, there, there's a wealth of artists making beautiful crafts in Hawaii. But uh, the thing is, there there haven't been a lot of venues, I think, for people to be doing this sort of work. You need space. You need you need funding. Funding. I mean, uh, space is always available, but uh, you need funding. Um, I think this is pretty. The, it is. Most of the norm of contemporary art in the mainland is uh, a lot more theory-based, a lot more concept-based, performance-based sort of stuff than we see in Hawaii. But uh, there are quite a few people working, doing really compelling stuff, I think. Yeah, I find it, uh, it's really stretching the mind. It's not just a visual um, opportunity to enjoy something. It's really forcing you to think, and as you uh, use the nature and science and uh, putting it together, it, it, so how has that affected your projects going forward? What, what, what's the next step in terms of development of your art? So we've seen some of the earlier works, and we're going to see one more piece. Actually, let's hold the thought and sure. see the very last image. Uh, yeah. I love this piece. And this is actually a three-dimensional piece. Yeah, these, this is made out of an uh, old movie poster. Uh, these are some of the earliest ones I did, like these. Um, this whole series was made out of paper objects, printed matter. And uh, what is it? Let's describe oh, it. Let's see. This, is, this was a movie poster. I don't remember what celebrity it was, but their face has been folded. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of folding called kirigami. It's not quite origami. Uh, the difference is that you can cut and you can glue. So I, mo I find and I modify patterns and sort of superimpose them onto these found images. So where it was once a woman's face, is that right? I think that one's a woman, yeah. I see the lips, and now it's a ferocious looking Yeah, I think animal. this is like some sort of fox bear or something. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what this one was, but yeah. Um, I was using anything from movie posters to magazines. Uh, when I came back to Hawaii, I did a pretty extensive edition using uh, the free media in Waikiki. You know, as you walk right. around, there's those kiosks. Full of magazines. Full of magazines. Glossy yeah. pictures. Glossy of pictures depicting the beach. people at the right. beach and lots of lots of bodies. Um, high quality paper. High right? quality paper. Yeah. So Free. it's a really nice art resource. But uh, you know, I was doing things like uh, collecting the real estate ads, uh, cutting out thousands of real estate people, making coral reefs out of them. Uh, I did a lot of work within Hawaii regarding uh, sort of creation narratives and ideas about nature, reanimating them through these uh, cut and fold uh, kirigami techniques. And they're actually stop, they were stop motion videos. Uh, uh huh. I remember were, your video. Yeah, digital composites, but uh, stop motion. Are you motion. doing any more work in video? No, I haven't done any work like that in a while. Um, and how about sculpture like the one we just saw? Mm, no, I haven't touched the metal stuff. Uh, I've decided I need uh, better safety facilities to be melting mm -hmm. metal than my garage. Uh, are there collectors for your, um, like the sculpture and? Yeah, the, the business the, stuff the had meeting. been pretty popular. Have that they stuff, been? I had a few collectors uh, with that stuff, but it's been uh, it's been a hard sell with the mushroom paintings. Mm -hmm. so far. <laughs> <laughs> They've only come out once. They're not technically for sale, but. But uh, for you, it doesn't seem that's your goal as much as it is to explore that relationship. Yeah. Well, I still think it's interesting producing an artistic yeah. object because it really bridges this gap between people who don't have a background in art theory and can't really understand the context for a lot of work. But uh, you know, I think looking at something and 
reconsidering what the object is, reconsidering, you know, this painting's actually <clears throat> made out of acrylic paint, you know, that's a plastic, this painting's gonna last. Even the, the byproducts of this painting, the frame of this painting, there's so many things we just don't account for <clears throat> in the materiality of objects. And for me, the materials really are the, uh, the message of the work. The materials, right. And just before we sh show the last image, I asked you what is the next step in terms of your artwork that you're working on now or mm -hmm. that you see yourself going toward? Um, well, right now I've been expanding the mushroom work. Uh, I am... How? How? Mostly in size, uh, drastically in size. This first edition was sort of a test. I hadn't so really done So the panels one. before, the current panels on exhibit are probably what? 12 by yeah. 10 inches or 8 inches? Yeah, maybe like they're about 12 by 18, I think. Mm -hmm. oh. So yeah, I hope to be uh, expanding dramatically. And what kind of response have you been getting from the public, from critics, from um, the mainland, from well, scientists? I think people in Hawaii really appreciate uh, that there is an environmental uh, relationship to this stuff, that somebody is taking account and you know, integrating that sort of things. Uh, you know, it fits in Hawaii a lot more, though. It is hard to, and a lot of this stuff isn't designed to be taken out because of agricultural quarantine and things like that. Right. It is meant to be site-specific, and it is meant to be an involvement with this environment. And appreciated here. Yeah, right. but, uh, you know, thanks to the digital uh, revolution here, we can share it with anybody. Right. Well, we're ready to wind up. I'm going to give you one opportunity to remind people where they can see your the exhibit before it closes. Oh, great. Um, there, this is last week. Uh, the hub is open at the Old Sports Authority down on Ward Avenue. Uh, it's open from 12 to about 7 p.m. And uh, this Saturday, there's a closing party. Uh, that will be fun. But if you can, please go down. Uh, my work is alongside some incredibly talented artists. And I'm really fortunate to be in the space. And great. Well. Thanks again to my guest artist, Chris Ritson, who has shared the absolutely unique art with us. And this is art that crosses with nature and science and stimulates us to new levels. I, I look forward to following your already successful career and growing recognition, Chris. So do stop by the biennial and check out Chris's work. And I also want to thank our wonderful floor manager, Ray, <laughs> and our production engineer, Rob. So on behalf of ThinkTech and everyone who's contributed to these productions, mahalo. If you want to see this show again, please go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Aloha. <laughs>